going live. So give me a second. Alrighty. We are, uh, looks like we are up and live. Hey Mark, how is uh, your Monday going? Hey Charles, uh, yeah, happy Monday. I think uh, I think we're uh, I think we're in for another exciting week. I hope um, last week was pretty good, and uh, this week uh, the market is undecided if it wants to continue the rally from last week or if we want to go back into a little bit of a pullback. So. Um, It'll be interesting, no, no doubt, um, which way it goes. Obviously, we don't know. Um, we don't have crystal balls. We just uh, read, read the signs, right? So um, we do know that nothing goes up or down in a straight line. So obviously, everybody's hoping, praying that the bull market returns. Um, and maybe it's starting. Um, but we know it does, even in, even in the most parabolic bull market, um, things don't go in a straight line. So uh, we ran pretty hard. I mean, Bitcoin jumped a thousand bucks. Um, you know, we saw so, I mean, we saw a, a, a lot of positions in our portfolio go up over 50%, some of them yeah. up over 100%. So, yeah. you know, a little pullback is, is necessary, not scary. No, definitely. Um, well, I know what's exciting in my world. It's snowing in Chicago. So what? it is April 16th. Yeah, there's probably, there's even been accumulation. If I look out my window, I can't move my webcam. But if you look out of my window, let me see if you can see it at all. Yeah, you see, you can't look out the window because the light, the light and the angle gets it. But it is white outside. There's probably maybe quarter inch of accumulation on the ground right now wow yeah so <laughs> that's fun but no you're definitely right i mean it doesn't normally rain there does it uh what do you mean it does rain in chicago I'm sorry. It, does, it doesn't normally snow there right yeah april mid-april is a little late for uh snow to be coming in but it's here yeah and cool well I'm in Southern yeah. California. We don't get rain or snow. So <laughs> uh, I don't know anything about that. Like we get, I saw in Kauai over in Hawaii, the Island of Kauai got like 28 inches of rain in like a, in like a day. Uh -huh. And that's causing like massive problems over there as you might imagine. Um, but it's like, that's more than we get in a whole year. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. I mean, we live in a desert, you know, so. Uh, no, definitely. That's definitely. Um, so I found it, uh, let's catch up, you know. I, I've been looking at stuff since the weekend and it appears that there's been a, uh, it appears to me that there seems to be a shift now, uh, a slight shift, more of a positive outlook now seems to be coming up versus, you know, the end is near. Um, well, um, I mean, I, I think- or, 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 Yeah, you can go ahead, Mark. Well, when you talk about a, a market shift, uh, you know, from people thinking that the end was near to now feeling positive about it. So, so typically we call that market sentiment. So that's the sentiment. That's how people feel about the market. And so, yeah, obviously, um, as prices are crashing, people are negative. And, and as prices are rising, especially as they rise super fast, then people start to feel more positive again. Um, so... I guess it's kind of like, uh, is it the chicken or the egg, which comes first, right? Is it that sentiment changes and that drives the price up or is that price goes up and then sentiment changes? Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, chicken or the egg type, uh, type you know, question. Um, the thing that's important to keep track of and hopefully most people realize is that um, you know, the market cap went from about 200, actually, so a week ago today, it was at 257 billion. And today, right now, as I'm talking, it's at 321 billion. So that's a gain of uh, about $80 billion since last Monday that we talked. And so a lot of people go, wow, $80 billion came into the space. $80 billion, you know, people invested $80 billion. And then likewise, when it goes down, people
people think that they pulled money out. Like everyone's like, oh, taxes. Everyone's pulling $80 billion out to pay their taxes. Well, that's not how it works. Nobody pulled $80 billion out and nobody put $80 billion in. It's the value of the market. So that means it's how much people are willing to pay for those existing assets. And so that's why I, I, the reason why I bring that up is because what you said, Charles, about sentiment. And so when people feel good about the market, they're willing to pay more. And when people mm -hmm. feel bad about the market, they want to pay less. And so it's the value of the market that we see, the value changed by 80 billion. And so, yeah, so from a week ago today, it was 257. Um, it went up as high as 338. So that's, that's over a 30% increase. So um, definitely people are feeling better about it, no doubt. And we measure that in real money. <laughs> They're feeling 30% better about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, I, I haven't been checking my portfolio as of late, but I think after we talked on Friday, I did take a peek at some things and I did feel 30% better, if not more, <laughs> you know, from earlier in the Yeah, I mean, there, there's just been such amazing opportunities, you know. I mean, we saw big names like, I mean, Ethereum was down to, you know, 370 or 380 and it popped up to like 525. I mean, that's a massive gain. Obviously, yeah, uh, I, 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 got a, I got a decent amount of Ethereum at uh, the 3, 380, 390 level or something. So, Yeah, we had, uh, you know, NEO uh, had, had bumped all the way up to almost 200 and people wanted to know if they could still get in. Well, then it dropped all the way down to like $45. Today it's up to 65 That was really good. Um, wow. Cardano, which isn't really in our portfolio, but it's one that I watch, um, had dropped all the way to $0.12 cents, and today it's up to 24 that's 100%. Wow, 100% gain. Jeez, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but we did have, you know, we had uh, GNT in our in our portfolio popped a 150%. Um, and like I said, we saw so many of our coins in our portfolio pop over 50%. Um, so yeah, we all feel better about it for sure. And, uh, you know, like I said, will that keep going? Obviously, um, Obviously, uh, like I said, we're, we're, we're in a little bit of a pullback. I'll bring this up. Let me pull something up here for a second here. So a lot of people um, think that we're not done with the correction. And the reason why they say that is because they believe we haven't gone through the full market cycle. And when I say the full market cycle, people believe that we need to go into what's called capitulation. I'm going to pull this chart up and show you this. So people believe that in order to go through the full market cycle, we have to go through capitulation, which is the point where everybody basically gives up on it. And so <laughs> um, a lot of people, so let me pull this up. So a lot of people might have seen this. Um, this is the Wall Street cheat sheet. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Um, and so this I is what I call it. I love that word, by the way, capitulation. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, so this is the wall street cheat sheet. This is the psychology of a market cycle. And so this has been shown a bunch of times. This is not my, this is, I didn't make this. Um, I'm sure most people have maybe seen a glimpse of this. Maybe they don't understand it, but basically you start at the bottom left and you go from like hope and, and disbelief. Then you go into optimism and then you go into belief, like, Oh, okay, it's on. This is going on. Then you go into thrill, like, oh my gosh, this is so, so exciting. I got to tell all my friends. I got to tell, you know, I got to buy more. I got to buy more, which is then what really pushes that last bit of, of gain at the top, which we go into euphoria. And I love what they say here. I'm a genius. We're all going to be rich. <laughs> See how they say that? So everybody feels really, really smart in a strong bull market because you can basically close your eyes, throw a dart at the board and make money. So everyone, oh my gosh, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to become a full-time investor, a full-time trader. I'm so smart. Well, you might have been a little smart because you were able to uh, spot a trend and, and really probably more than smarts, you had the guts to jump in on that, right? So many people were scared to sit on the sideline. The problem is you feel so smart. You're in such a euphoric state. You don't think anything can ever go wrong and you take out all the risk out of your thinking. You know, you take away all your risk management and you're all in. And that's when the danger happens. So when everybody's feeling good, that's when you want to sell. When everybody's euphoric and trying to buy more, typically that's when you want to be selling because we know the next step is then it starts going down. 
So then it drops down and then we kind of have this complacency. Oh, you know, it's normal. We just need to cool off. You know, the next rally will come, but then it drops more. And then people start getting worried. Like, wow, I thought it would probably recover by now. Like this <laughs> normally, you know, we see 30%, but we're like 40%, 50%. And then we go into the denial. Uh, no, you know, I, I, I know, I feel good about this. I know these companies are good. You know, blockchain te tech is for real. I don't care what people are saying, but then it just keeps going. And then it's like panic. Oh my gosh, I've lost like 90% of my money. I need to just get out while I can. Like I, I can't afford to lose all this. Like, and so then they're panicking. That's when we hit capitulation. So capitulation is everybody's just getting out. I'm out. I'm out. I can't afford to lose anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm selling everything. Why did I do this? <laughs> and then, well, then the anger, I can't believe I did this. I lost all my money. I'm so stupid. <laughs> I, I, sh I should have listened to CNBC. This was a scam. And so anyway, I don't, I don't know if, well, we haven't hit the capitulation level yet. And so we're probably still like in the anxiety denial stage. And now we're bouncing. So it was, so most of the people were still in. And as you pointed out, Charles, like people are already starting to feel positive. And really it's not until we get down past the capitulation stage that that changes. Because as you can see, once we get down to anger, then it holds. So now it stays down for a long time. So it doesn't bounce back right away. It stays down and that's why we go into the depression. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, 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 I knew it. I, I, I'm so mad. I'm past anger though. Now I'm in depression. It's like uh, whatever, like the stages of grief, right? So it's like you go from anger to depression. And then when it starts coming back up, people don't believe it. So that's the, that's what we see is disbelief. No, this is a bull trap. This is a bear trap. Only suckers are getting back in. This is, you know, I'm, I'm not getting back in again. And so we have that disbelief rally. And if you look back to the left, you see we start on disbelief. And so we start that cycle all over. So the reason why I bring this all up is like, where are we in this? Did we get to capitulation? And if not, maybe we haven't gone through the full market cycle. Hmm. You know, it, it, it makes me think. I was actually uh, doing some research. Um, do you own any Apple stock, Mark? Or have you followed Apple over the years? Oh yeah, of course. I followed Apple. Um, I, I do not own any Apple stock at the moment. I have owned Apple stock, but I don't own any right now. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at this, you know, I was looking at the trends and I started to, you know, I, I've become more of a student of history since we've been talking. Right. So it's like, you know, this is the classic, you know, if you put 10, well, it's not like Bitcoin, but you know, if you'd put $10,000 into Apple stock 10 years ago, it'd be worth, you know, almost a hundred grand today. Right. You know, a 10 X, you know, that thousand percent return, that'd be amazing. Right. Right. But, you know, and all you had to do, you know, you don't have to worry about the fed, the economy, you just had to own Apple and go fishing. What was interesting is like, you know, if you bought Apple, what January, 2008 for $25 and then it would have dropped, you know, by March, 2008, it dropped 25%. And then, you know, by March 2009, Apple was down to $12 a share. So that was a 52% loss. And then, you know, if you just held on into 2011, you know, the stock would have hit 50 bucks and most people probably would have just sold at that point, right? Instead of holding on to where it is today, where, you know, Apple's, you know, over 150 bucks, you know, probably on its way to 200 plus. And, you know, that, that, that's just got me to thinking of what you've been saying and talking about and everything on that side where, you know, we let all our emotions drive us, right? You know, when it's going down, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I got to cut my losses. You know, I had a thousand bucks in there and I got 400 bucks and 400 bucks is better. You know, 40% of something is better than hundred percent of nothing. And, you know, I don't know by doing so, I think we end up missing out on more of the medium and longer term uh, gains that are available. Yeah, so it works. It works both ways. Um, I'll bring this up for a second. Um, I have a couple slides I can show you to kind of illustrate what you're talking about a little bit better. And it's a good point, And it's one that we haven't really brought up. Um, I talk about sometimes, but um, pull this up here. All right. So um, what you're looking at on my screen here is a chart of Cisco. 
Mm. Cisco from 1990 to 2000. And for those of you that don't know, Cisco makes um, what we call infrastructure um, stuff. So they make like the chips, the processors, the switches. So like they're like the plumbing of the internet. So they make the equipment that allows internet to work, right? So uh, that's, what I, that's what I typically call an infrastructure play. So mm -hmm. from 1990 to 2000 was the tech stock boom. This, um, it was all measured on the NASDAQ. So we have, you know, several different stock exchanges. The NASDAQ is really where all this wealth was, uh, was created. And so, um, and really that boom was from 1990 until 2000, as you can see from 1990, 91, 92, it stayed relatively flat, mm. um, right around 95 is where things started to take off. And then of course you can see there from 98 to 2000 for two years, it went almost parabolic. Now, of course, you can see even zoomed out like this, it does look like it went straight up, but of course, you know, you can see some wrinkles there. Um, a couple of the big wrinkles were this one right here. And this is from 94 to 95. Oh, wow. That's like a, that looks like almost like a 60%. That's, a, that's massive. Well, um, not only, so two things I want to bring up out about this. One is that, yes, it was a massive drop. But two, the length of time it took to get through that cycle. So we're looking at um, we're looking at over a year that we were down. So right now in the cryptocurrency market, for example, we've been down about 90 days. And people are like, oh man, I'm ready for the bull market to get back. We've been down 90 days. This drop was over a year. Hmm. So um, you know, I just want to point that out. So even though going back to this chart. Even though going, oh, going back to this chart, it looks straight up and look at 94, 95. You don't even see anything there. Mm. When you're zoomed out and you have that perspective, you don't even see 94, 95. It looks like in hindsight, you're like, oh man, I could have just bought in right around 91 and I could have held till 2000. I would have made a 60 times. I would have returned 60 times your money. I would have made a 60 times return. Oh my gosh. All I had to do is so simple, buy at 92 and sell it at 2000. But the fact is you never would have. And there's two reasons why you never would have done that. And one is simple. And that's what I just showed you is that right here, prices crashed hard and they stayed down for over a year. So you would have sold out. You would have given up. You would have been over it. Even if, let's say, you were strong enough to hold through that, well, then a couple years later, look at this one. You have another one. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. This is 97, 98. Like, this, is, this is another year. So, even, so you're, like, you're like, oh, it went from $2 to $1. Now it's up to $7. Oh, man, I, I'm so glad I held. What if I would have sold? I would have lost everything. And now it drops back down to 3 Oh, oh my gosh. Why didn't I sell at seven? I can't believe I held it all the way to three. I'm out. I, I, I went from one to three. I'm good. I'm out. Or let's say that you hold through this dip and you get back to seven and you're like, you know what? I can't believe I got back to seven. I didn't think I'd ever get back to seven. I'm out. I turned a dollar into $7. It's the best investment of my life. I'm happy. I'm out. You see? So even if you don't sell at the bottom, you're going to sell at seven. Now you've lived through two. You didn't think you were ever going to get your money back and I'm going to sell. But if you notice, you would have got out way down here. Oh, Look at man. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you held past that. Now you get to 20. Now you turned a dollar into 20. Oh my gosh, I'm selling. I made I, one to 20. That's amazing. Or you do it at 30 or you do it at 40 or you do it at 50. How do you hold until 60? How do you do that? Well, I'm going to tell you. You want to know? Yeah, tell me. I think we all want to know. <laughs> the way that we hold, not only through the dips, so holding through the dips is very difficult, and everybody who's been in, uh, in this space since about December knows this. Um, holding through the dips is very hard, and so um, that's difficult, but holding through the parabolic gains can be even harder. 
because like I said, we've lived through the dip. Now I've got my money back. Now I just want to sell. But how do we know when to sell? Of course, obviously at some point we have to get out, but how do we know when? So we, so the way that we do that is by understanding the trend and understanding what we're investing in. So for example, in this illustration here, the trend was that internet and computers were taking over and we believed at this time that we were, um, you know, seeing this new technology of the internet uh, start this new trend and it was going to change the way that we work and live and communicate. And so if you were one of those few that got in really early in 93, 94, you had to believe in the trend. And so um, you, you believed in the trend, you identified a company, Cisco, who you thought would be a leader in that trend, and then you bought in. Now, how do you keep from selling too early? Well, you have to wait for the trend to develop. So if I would have sold in 94, 95, the trend was nowhere near developing. Why would I have even bought in if I didn't believe in the trend, right? So I knew at 94, 95, the trend wasn't developed yet, so I was gonna keep holding. I knew in 97, 98, the trend wasn't developed yet, and I had to keep holding. And so we have to wait until that trend starts to run its course. And so we're in the same predicament today. And really, if I have to tell you where I think we are, and I've, I've told most of you guys this, I think we're here in this, in this trench in 94, 95. And so the trend hasn't even developed. And so we're not going to sell. We're not going to sell at the low or the high. And I've said it a bunch of times, like whether Bitcoin hit 50,000 or 5,000, either way, I'm not going to sell. So the price doesn't really uh, concern me that much because I'm not selling either way. I'm not going to go, oh, it hit 50,000, I'm out. No, because the, regardless of the price, the trend hasn't developed. And I want to give the trend time, if that makes sense. Well, you know, speaking of trends, I, uh, I, I guess I have to, you know, give you another one. Uh, I was uh, talking to a guy who used to run uh, like, the University of Chicago Endowment Fund. So, you know, call it a fund manager, trader, visionary type of guy. And he's now got his own little hedge fund and, you know, he's in crypto and everything. And he started lecturing me all on these custodial accounts and how they're important and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, because once a custodial accounts, you know, once a university, you know, endowment fund or a pension fund sees that, and, you know, the minute one of them puts it in, everyone else is going to put it in. And I, I, I couldn't help but like smile to myself, you know, remembering the fact that we were talking about this stuff, what, uh, almost six months ago about custodial accounts and smart yeah, money. Yeah, really, uh, I think it was about December when I first came out with that whole um, thought process and started talking about that. So, yeah, so at least five months. Yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, that's another big trend uh, that hopefully is you know, in the horizon or well, I don't know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call that a trend. So um, the trend is that this technology is going to change the world. And that's a trend. Um, when we talk about like the fact that we need custodial accounts, and that we're probably going to see them pretty soon. What that is, is that is a, uh, a step that we need to see in order to see the trend continue. And so what we're doing is like, okay, I believe this is going to become true. And then we're looking for actual facts that either validate or invalidate that thought. So if I started seeing things that were happening that would make that thought process untrue, then I would go, okay, maybe it's time to, you know, maybe that's not the way the market's moving. Let's, let's look and see what's happening. But what we're seeing is we're seeing all these things that just confirm it. So seeing that other people are seeing the same thing, talking about the same thing. And I believe probably in the next 30 to 90 days, we'll see the first custodial accounts pop up. And so that will be a factual thing that we see that confirms that we're seeing this trend play out in the way that we think it is. So um, I, I don't call that a trend in itself, but it confirms the trend. No, that's the, you're much more, you know, I, I probably use words a little loosely. Uh, you're much more, uh, formulaic and you know structured in terms of how you look at these things there's definitely no question about that yeah so most of the things that we talk about really are basically what i'm saying which is they're all like confirmations of that trend and so i like to monitor those things so as a fundamental investor i'm constantly keeping my finger on the pulse and looking for things that will continue to tell me 
um, that we are going that way or we're not. Um, it was interesting years ago, I read, um, I read a, a story about how the CIA um, makes their decisions. And so the CIA, obviously, I'm sure most of you guys people probably know about the CIA, but it's like the, you know, branch of some, I don't know, some branch of the government that does mostly this covert, whatever stuff. But um, basically what they do is they don't just assume that there's going to be one outcome. What they do is they will assume multiple outcomes. And then what they do is then they make a list of things that have to happen in each of the, for each of those potential outcomes to come true. And then they start to read the signs and they plug them into which of those outcomes are leading up to those steps. And that's how they identify where they're going. So they don't go, Hey, this is where we're going. And this is it. They come up with multiple scenarios the milestones that have to happen for each of those scenarios to happen. And then they just wait and they start plugging it in. So that's kind of the way that we do this. So, you know, we, we assume that this trend is happening. These are the things that have to happen. And then we wait and see if those things are fulfilling and they are, and they are. And that's why we talk about them every day. Is that, is that kind of interesting? You know, it, it actually makes me think, uh, have you heard about this uh, new Netflix documentary called the push? I haven't. No. You got to check it out. So, you know, obviously, you know, I'm all about, you know, uh, you know, persuasion and human emotion and everything like that. So the push is a new reality series or not a reality. It, let me take it back. It is a reality documentary. And the question is, can, you know, I guess the guy's studying, you know, bad decision making, you know, things from like the Holocaust or things from genocides or things like that. So the question he asks is, can I set up a sequence of events where I can get a regular person off the street to ultimately commit murder? Now, um, they don't actually kill the person, you know, in the end. It is a staged murder where, like, the ultimate final act is to get the person to push someone off a roof. And the person is, uh, you know, protected with, you know, fall protection. So he, the person doesn't really die. But literally, like, as you follow the sequence like the architect or the person behind it knows that like, as long as the people keep doing certain things, they will inevitably push that person off the ledge. And what's fascinating is like, you know, they've, the, the documentary shows four people that went through this process, but like the one person who didn't basically stopped showing compliance or started doing things on a different route, and you can literally see the guy saying, oh, crap, this fact isn't, ha this event isn't happening. This event isn't happening. The entire, you know, process is, you know, the, the entire process is going to suspect. This guy's not going to push at the end off the roof. And, you know, lo and behold, because these other facts don't occur, the result or the anticipated result doesn't happen. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, you should check it out. It, 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 it's definitely a... Uh, it's definitely a good, uh, yeah, if you have Netflix, check it out. It's called The Push. It's, it's very eye-opening. It just came out about a month ago. And it's, fa it, yeah, I, I was blown away by it this weekend. Hmm. Interesting. But, okay. Yeah, but going back. So speaking of facts, uh, in the last week, any facts that you see that kind of tell you one way or another in terms of what's come to reality or what's going well, there's, on? There's been, there's been so many. And, and so basically every week I've been kind of outlining them. I don't want to, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to keep, I don't necessarily want to keep repeating them only because I don't want people to get sick of me here saying the same thing. But, um, but uh, you know, so we've seen, you know, big, basically we've seen big time investments happening. Um, you know, hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars have been being spent by the largest institutions in the world to set up infrastructure for this to happen. So the big, the big transition that I see happening is we're going from a, a really the, the token being utility to now wanting to become securities. And so that presents a lot of opportunity, but it also presents a lot of problems. And so the industry isn't really ready for that transition to happen. For example, exchanges aren't set up or allowed to even have security coins. And so we're starting to see exchanges being bought by government and billionaire leaders to change them into be able to handle securities. So we've seen that happening. 
Um, we've seen uh, the some, two of probably the biggest, richest, most well-known investors in the world, the Rockefeller family and the George Soros family, both create funds to get into cryptocurrency. So those were some big ones. Um, one, one thing that we've seen that's been pretty interesting is uh, a, lot of, a lot of people maybe don't know this or haven't seen this, but there's a country, it's an island, but it's a country called Malta. And they are um, attracting everybody in the world to come set up and become a company in Malta because they are just super pro, uh, pro blockchain technology. And they're doing everything that they can to um, set up, uh, set up, you know, regulations that are super favorable to blockchain companies. And um, they're setting up, they're, they're actually putting money into, you know, different foundations to help cultivate this and grow this. And um, we know that Binance, which is uh, basically came from nowhere to become one of the largest exchanges in the world in like six months, has decided to move over to Malta. Mm. Um, we saw um, oh, OK, OKX, uh, which is another big exchange. They've decided to move over to Malta. And I think Malta is like quadrupled or 10x their uh, their tax revenue just in the last like couple months from bringing in these companies, um, and so that that's definitely um, a piece that we see towards this you know confirmation that things are continuing to go this way and, and confirmation of the trend. So obviously the trend is that blockchain technology is going to you know grow and change this world, and within that uh, overall trend, obviously there's little trends in between there. But just confirming that this overall trend is true, that blockchain technology is not going away, that blockchain technology will continue to evolve, we can see that, we can confirm that by countries like Malta saying, hey, we're behind this, we're backing it, we're going to incubate this. And um, so that, that's a pretty big piece. Wow. So I, I got a question, you know, so, you know, ultimately, uh, all things are semi, semi interrelated, right? So while I don't you know, I'm sure just like you, you know, we have portfolios that span all sorts of things. So I'm curious, you know, obviously the, you know, crypto and the blockchain is kind of the anti-banking and anti-finance sector, uh, as some people might put it. And uh, bank earnings, you know, this is earnings seasons right now for, you know, all the major banks, you know, on the Wall Street side. And uh, I wonder, you know, and I'd be curious to get your opinions. I mean, right now, it looks like, uh, what is it? You know, B of, B of A uh, is, you know, reported good earnings. Um, JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo and Citigroup, you know, are also uh, beating, you know, share expectations, but their stock price, you know, despite all this, you know, actually stock prices on the banking side are actually a little bit depressed. So, you know, and I know you've mentioned in the past that, you know, maybe it's, you know, the financial sector could impact the crypto sector or, you know, there's some sort of bleed or you've had some concerns about fiscal policy or anything on that front? Well, I mean, you, you are right. We are going into earnings seasons. Uh, most people are anticipating that we have a pretty good earnings season. So hopefully that means the rest of the year should still be pretty good for the stock market. Um, as far as just banking, you know, banking profits and whatnot, yeah, we know that um, blockchain, you know, cryptocurrencies are super disruptive for the banking industry. It's interesting if you if you look at like internet technology and as as much as it's changed our lives. I mean, I, I can't imagine living without the internet, even though I did. I guess I can imagine it. I did, but um, it, it was hard to go back to not having that. But internet technology didn't really change anything. It, it, it improved things, but it didn't change them. So, for example, I, I was always able to mail somebody. Now I can mail them faster through email, right? So it improved that. I could always bank, but it improved the way I can interact with my bank. So it improved things. But blockchain technology changes things. So it gets rid of the bank. That's the big thing. So we know it's disruptive in that way. Now, uh, getting back to your question about does it disrupt, you know, these financial earnings and whatnot? It, I, I believe it certainly will. Um, but as I was saying earlier, like we're so early in this trend, it's not even really taken off yet, right? So um, 
just like the internet, you know, in, in, even in 2000, I've told the story a bunch of times in 2001, I started an e-commerce company and people wouldn't even sell me stuff because they thought that no one would ever buy anything online. And, you know, less than 15 years later, hundred year old companies like Kmart and Sears are out of business because of it. So it can happen really quickly, but it doesn't happen right away. So, um, the banks, I don't, you know, they're not suffering right now. Um, the technology isn't really usable, but it can happen really quickly. And I, and I believe it will impact them big time, you know, unless the government steps in and outlaws it somehow, or they get behind it. Hmm. So there was a, uh, yeah. So we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen with that. I try, I really try not to focus on the issue of money too much. Mm. Um, I, 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 the reason why, obviously, I, I, I guess I'm probably as uh, interested in it as anybody. And I can talk about it all day. And we can sit here and have our philosoph philosophical, uh, con you know, conversation. And we can just, you know, speculate which one's going to win out, how it'll play out. The reason why I typically try to stay away from those conversations though, is because I believe it, it uh, puts the blinders on too much. And I only think about blockchain as in money and what it does the financial institution. And I completely overlook the massive opportunity it has in every area of our life. And so we're going to make money in shipping logistics and food quality management and decentralized storage and internet security. We're going to make money in all those areas, way more money than we're going to make looking at the money aspect of blockchain technology. So mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely disruptive. And I think a lot of people love the fact that it is disruptive and we all hope that it does take, you know, it does do what we think it's going to do, but it may not, it may not, you know, the banks are going to fight it with every ounce of their being, Maybe they'll kill it. You know, the governments can't allow another money source that they can't control. So maybe it's dead. But that doesn't change the fact that the majority of our money is going to be made outside of the money conversation. So I like to talk about it. I enjoy it. But I don't want to focus on it because I think people miss the whole ball here. Mm. No, fair enough. Um, on a more crypto note, I guess, have you been following the uh, discussions going about uh, going around Ethereum? and how they're uh, potentially talking about adjusting uh, how the Ethereum token economy functions? Well, there's a couple of things that they've been talking about in regards to that. So anyway, uh, to answer your question, yes. <laughs> um, I have a massive interest in Ethereum, so I, I follow it like a hawk. There's two things that they've been talking about. One, and they've been talking about for quite a while, which is... Um, they want to change the, the entire way the Ethereum network does their consensus. Um, and they want to shift from a POW to a POS. Hmm. Um, and so that's proof of work, which means people buy computers, hook them up to the network and do mining operations. That's proof of work. And they want to switch that to POS, which is proof of stake, which means now I don't have to buy a computer. I just put my, I lock my tokens up and I stake them. So that's one big piece to that. I'm guessing you're talking about a different piece, which just kind of came out, which didn't really surprise me, but basically uh, they came out and said that they want to create a hard cap on their tokens. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it started with uh, kind of a quasi April Fool's joke, right? When, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, so they, they, they came out and said that they want to lock up or uh, create a hard cap on their tokens. Um, I can't say that I'm surprised about it uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, just for the fact that um, it's, it's, it's a really good thing to do. It creates a lot of value in their coins. Um, so I can see that. The, the second reason why I'm not that surprised about it is that most of you guys might be already aware that Ethereum had a massive hard fork a couple of years ago, and it created Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. So Basically, Ethereum Classic is the original Ethereum. Ethereum is the new version. And they had a big disagreement. And they disagreed on, you know, there was a hack. There was a bunch of money taken. They wanted to rewind the network to get that money, that stolen money back. Which sounds like a good idea. The reason why it's not a good idea is because blockchain is supposed to be immutable. Once it's done, it's done. And so it's not supposed to be rolled back. And so they had a big disagreement. And some, 
people wanted to roll back and some people didn't. The Ethereum Classic crowd did not. So they didn't roll it back. They, they stuck to their guns and that's what created this fork. Anyway, Ethereum Classic was an exact copy where they both copies of each other, but now they've kind of started to move in, in separate, separate ways. And Ethereum Classic put in a hard, uh, hard cap on their tokens uh, maybe a year ago or I don't know, maybe not that long ago, six, nine months ago. Um, sometime in the last year, they put a hard cap on their tokens. And so that's why it doesn't surprise me to see Ethereum do that. They're very related. Um, and so if one did it, I could see it making sense to do it on the other one. What would be, you know, from your opinion, what are the ramifications um, of a hard cap? You know, there's a lot of debate going on uh, right now on that front. What would be the ramifications of it? Yeah, I mean, well, the two are. potential ones and uh, on opposite sides of the coin. So the good ramifications as an investor is that when you have a hard cap, basically that creates um, limited supply. So demand goes up, supply goes down, it should bring the price up. So that's, as an investor, I like that. I like to see the hard cap. As a user, as a developer, it can make it more expensive, which then makes it cost prohibitive for me to run on the network. So it's now, kind of that like, creates, uh, but now that creates an ecosystem problem, right? Because as an investor, even though I want scarcity, if the policy you know, uh, limits, uh, development, which ultimately, you know, would diminish usage adoption, possibly blah, blah, blah. You know, that could be shooting myself in the foot, right? Yeah. So I was going to say is it's a catch 22. So as an investor, I want the network to take off because I want usage to go up, which increases demand. But if it creates, uh, if it becomes cost prohibitive, less people use it and demand goes down. So it's uh, it's a catch twenty two there. Um, there, it's it's not a problem that we'll have to worry about for a really long time. Um, the hard cap won't be reached for a long time. So um, Ethereum is still an inflationary coin, so they're still producing new Ethereum, mm -hmm. but they also have like a burn mechanism as well. So it's kind of like a mint and burn type mechanism. Mm. So it's probably not something that we'll have to deal with for quite a while. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. They haven't, you know, come out with everything. So I can't really say again, you know, using the multiple scenario type example, these mm. are two things that could happen. Let's see how this kind of plays out. So I don't, I don't, I, I like, uh, I like the idea of a hard cap, uh, but it could have some bad, you know, ramifications and we'll just kind of see how that plays out. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've been just reading stuff and it seems like, you know, there definitely are both sides. Um, from an investor perspective, most people like the concept of a limited supply of uh, Ethereum tokens and everything on that side, you know? Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I can definitely see both uh, perspectives. Yeah, phone. so that's interesting. We'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I saw, I saw another news headline. It doesn't mean a whole lot for everybody, but I wanted to just bring it up to you, which I thought was pretty interesting. But uh, you had talked a while, uh, quite a while ago, about uh, we, we were we were talking about how companies were just just like in the internet boom in the, in the nineties, people would just add dot com to their name and raise a bunch of money, and now um, we were seeing companies just add blockchain to their title and and raise a bunch of money. And you had uh, mentioned about. Long Island uh, blockchain or whatever, changing their name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they got delisted. <laughs> NASDAQ, oh, wow. NASDAQ delisted them. Um, so uh, a combination of uh, they didn't like, you know, how they did that. Um, you know, they pivoted from T to, to blockchain. And um, did they you know, just shut down T production then? Or how did that whole, I, I didn't follow it close enough. Like, what was their thought process? Or do you, do you know, or are you just saying, you just saw that they... Why did they do that? Well, I, I understand maybe why, but like, did they just... Well, you're the one that, you're the one that brought it up. So, uh, you know, and this was a long time ago, so it's, I know it's not top yeah. of head. Um, I don't, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't spend a, even a second thinking about it because I don't really oh. care. Um, yeah. So I wasn't going to research into why they may have done that. Obviously, obviously we can guess why they probably did that, right? Um so uh, I'll stick with my guess. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, the outcome doesn't really matter to me one way or another. I just thought it was interesting. 
Um, I saw that and I thought I'd bring it up just because I know you had pointed out. But yeah, they tried to jump on the bandwagon, change it from Long Island Ice Tea to Long Island Blockchain. And uh, NASDAQ said, nope. And, and they kicked them off um, the exchange. So that was interesting. Wow, that's pretty... <laughs> That's a pretty serious ramification. I mean, that's a pretty serious. That sucks. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean. That's that's pretty intense. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, I don't. I don't know the full reasons why they got kicked off. Um, assuming that it may have been something to do with you know kind of this uh, fake name change just to capture investor money. Maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe Nasdaq uh, policing their exchange is a good thing because it keeps scammers off the platform. Mm. Um, so maybe that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, I also saw another uh, piece of FUD come out um, that I thought was a little bit interesting. And uh, it was an article with a guy, uh, some, a Swiss researcher, and he was saying that Bitcoin still has a lot to fall um, because of Metcalf's law. And so mm -hmm. this is a piece of FUD. It, it, it's a piece of news that creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And a lot of times this news seems to kind of come out at the same time and create this fear and this panic, which brings the prices down. And basically this news story came out and uh, they had these researchers say that Bitcoin still has 40 billion left to fall because of Metcalf's law. And we talk about Metcalf's law uh, quite a bit. And so for the, those of you guys who don't know what that means, it's basically the, the network effect. And so that means that the more connected devices there are, the more the network is worth. So, um, I've said before, like if I had one fax machine, it's worthless. As soon as there's two fax machines, it's worth a little bit more. When there's a million fax machines, it's worth even more. When everyone has a fax machine, it's worth even more. So the more connections we have, the greater the network is. And what they stated is that because uh, they said it's uh, num they said it was in in relation to the number of people that are using the network. So because of Net Metcalf's law the number of people using the Bitcoin network have gone down. So they believe the value should go down. The, the, the flaw that I have with this and the reason why it's important to look at this, this, this not fake news, but bad news and learn to have, learn to look, look at it with some critical thinking is that as I actually, I, I was just talking about none of this technology that we're really working with is usable. So they're saying it's because the number of users has gone down. Well, nobody's using it really. <laughs> we're investing into it. We're buying it. We're hodling it, but nobody's really using it. So uh, I think their entire argument is flawed and I wouldn't put any merit to anything like that. And so, you know, it's just, I, I want to bring that up. You know, everybody should look at this, this news, understand who put it out, what's the motivation, you know, and really look at their argument and seeing if it's sound. And in this case, to me, it doesn't seem reasonable at all. Wow. So, uh, well, you know, unfortunately we don't have uh, Yusef on today. Um, he was busy. I guess he's gotten busy with uh, Forex and some gold uh, trading on his end when he was on earlier before our call. So uh, it's getting time to wrap up. Uh, you want to try to make a prediction for the week? <laughs> <laughs> um, if I had to make a prediction, you know, and, and obviously we, we bring Yusuf, Yusuf in o only because he's the, you know, technical master and he's really playing the upside and the downside, trying to take advantage of every little move in the market. Now, Charles and I have a very insider view to what he's doing. And I can tell you that, um, for most people, it would exhaust them to death to understand <laughs> what he's doing. Um, but he, he's watching that, you know, for me. I'm playing the trend, right? I'm, 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 I'm identifying the trend. I'm looking for pieces that are falling in along with that trend. And so whatever happens with the price over the course of this, this week, I don't really care. So I don't spend a lot of time focusing on that. Um, but you're asking me, so um, I'll attempt. Um, if I had to guess what's going to happen in the short term, like in this week, uh, I would say over the next week or two, there should be another pullback coming. Mm. Um, because for, for a number of reasons, one is that a number of, uh, very, very, very good charters, t technical analysts that I believe and follow are telling me that. Um, but secondly, I just know that after a good run up, you typically have a pullback. So it's just cycles. Um, so I think we're due for one. 
Um, now, how far is the question? Uh, you know, I don't know. I can tell you, we talked about on Friday, I have FOMO. And my FOMO is that um, I was expecting the market to pull back a little bit further to time some new entries. And that didn't happen. And now some positions I've looked at, positions that were on my list to put money into have gone up 100%. So um, I'm FOMOing. And um, the lesson that I continue to have to learn, and hopefully you would learn from this, is that when you see something at the price that you like, you just got to buy it. And, and, you know, when it's a good price, you know, whether it goes up or down a little bit, it doesn't really matter um, as much. And so, um, you know, maybe it'll come down a little bit. I don't know, but I believe buying anything at these prices is amazingly cheap. I mean, we're still at 60, 70% off. Um, so if I had to guess, I think we'll have a little bit more of a correction, but um, if you're waiting on the sidelines, actually, Charles, why don't you update us <laughs> because you had sold your Bitcoin to hoping to buy in cheaper and now that's run away on you. How's that playing out right now? Ooh, <laughs> ooh. Um, so uh, I did buy back in of a portion of the position. So I guess that means... So you sold two Bitcoin at like 69, 68, 69? Yeah, basically so 69. Buy back in at 64? Uh, yeah, the plan was, you know, kind of like what you were doing. I decided to play a little more uh, charting. So uh, I just, yeah, I sold some Bitcoin at 6,900 with the anticipation that it would hit. Uh, I think it was the anticipation was a $6,100 uh, level. So instead of 6,100, I said, well, let me just be safe and I'll lock in something at 6,400. And actually, yeah, we were talking about that last week because I was talking about putting back in a stop limit order to cover me on the upside. So uh, unfortunately for me, um, I missed out on the Bitcoin side because Bitcoin jumped. And what I did is I redeployed half of my cash, but instead of putting it all in Bitcoin, I had this... I decided to put some more into, you know, uh, I, I think I put, I put, you know, I, I put about seven or 8,000 of it back in. So basically one Bitcoin worth back in of cash. And I split it half and half between uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So not saying everything's perfect, but the Ethereum jump, uh, I think from Wednesday or Thursday, Ethereum's up pretty significantly uh, from last week. So that Ethereum jump hasn't covered my loss on the Bitcoin side for covering, but it definitely, uh, it definitely eased some of the pain. Yeah. So the difference in what Charles and I are talking about is he actually sold his coins at a higher price to try to buy back in at a lower price. Um, I didn't sell any of my coins. I wrote them down. I'm writing them back up. I was looking at putting new money in. So that's a little bit of a difference. Now, some of the coins, as I talked about, have exploded over 50%. Some of the coins, one of the coins went up 150% in just like two days. And you never know when that's going to happen. And if I had sold out of that coin trying to buy back in lower, I totally would have missed that. And so by staying in, I was able to capture that upside. So different ways to play it. You know, you can decide what seems to work best for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so here's the question, right? So you have FOMO because you didn't pull the trigger. So now did you pull the trigger or are you still kind of sitting back uh, waiting for this, uh, what do you call it, the retracement or the, the dip? I, I, haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger. So, um, <laughs> I, haven't, oh. I haven't pulled the trigger. Um, you know, for me, again, my thought process is just a little bit different and I'll, and I'll fill you in. So I have a very sizable portfolio, um, pretty sizable. Um, so I already have so much in, um, yeah, I'm looking to put new money in, um, uh, but I'm not in a big rush. And even if I don't put the new money in, I don't really care. Um, you know, it's like, I kind of want to put some new stuff in, um, uh, but you know, I'm not going to chase it. And, um, you know, everything is so cheap right now. You know, for example, I like dash up to 600 bucks. It's at like 300 right now. If I miss 300 and I buy it at 400, Eh, it's not really going to, it's not really going to concern me that much. So, um, that's my thought process is a little bit different, you know? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, as always, uh, thanks for everyone for still tuning in. We still have, uh, almost 40 people, uh, still, 
<laughs> who've lasted for the entire hour. Uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully there's more movement in the market. Um, it's always exciting when things go up. Uh, it's never exciting when things go down, but you know, such is life. And uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Hey, talk to you soon, Mark. Okay.